Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. You can view the live stream on Facebook at Mother Miriam Live. Now, here's Mother Miriam. Good morning, beloved family. How are you doing? I pray that you are well. I pray you had a good uh, second Sunday of Lent. Um, And we are in the, I guess, beginning the third week of Lent with this uh, following the second Sunday. Um, And it's, um, it's a glorious time of the year. And I tell you what, if you've, I know some of you have been defeated or felt defeated. I'll tell you that I have also, but we're not defeated. We're not defeated. We're all in the same boat, the bark of Peter, and we're going to heaven if we stay in the boat, if we stay with our Lord. So don't let momentary defeats or discouragements or anything defeat you ultimately. That's just the enemy's way of getting into your weaknesses. Don't let it stop you. Forge ahead and and renew your commitments every day. This is from the rule of St. Benedict, by the way. Every day we begin again. Every single day we begin again. And today we're going to begin again on the sermons of St. Francis de Sales for Lent. And then after the second break, we'll be happy and delighted to take your calls, your texts, and your emails I'll give you the toll-free number in advance. It's one 511 5483 and the email is mother at com. And we are beginning a new chapter that I think all of us need and can relate to. I need it. Um, and it's titled Temptation. And there's nobody better than St. Francis de Sales to tell us how to fight temptation. He's simply, he's a doctor of the church, he is a master of the faith, and as I've said often, I think the greatest pastor God has ever given us. Just tremendous. And he said, this is an admonition of the sage, my son, if you intend to serve God, prepare your soul for temptation. Quote, My son, if you intend to serve God, prepare your soul for temptation, end quote. Shall I read that a third time? We need to prepare our souls for temptation if we're serving God. Um, And he continues, for it is an infallible truth that no one is exempt from temptation when he has truly resolved to serve God. So if you're struggling, if you're fighting temptation, um, it's because you have resolved to serve God. It's your fault. (laughs) But it's by God's grace that you resolve to serve him. It's a good thing. And he says, this being the case, our Lord himself chose to be subjected to temptation in order to show us how we ought to resist it. Thus the evangelists tell us that he, our Lord, was led into the desert by the Spirit to be tempted. And St. Francis says, I shall draw lessons from this mystery for our particular instruction in as familiar a manner as I am able. And I know you would have heard a a homily on it yesterday. And this, um, this will be wonderful. He says, in the first place, I note that although no one can be exempt from temptation, still no one should seek it or go of his own accord to the place where it may be found. No, 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 no. For undoubtedly, he who loves it, he who loves temptation, will perish in it. That is why the evangelist says that our Lord was led into the desert by the Spirit to be tempted. Now, he didn't go himself. He was led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, beloved. He was led by God to be tempted. 
it was not then by his choice that St. Francis says, I am speaking with regard to his human nature. It was not by his choice that he went to the place of temptation, but he was led by the obedience he owed to his heavenly Father. I find in Holy Scripture, says St. Francis, I find in Holy Scripture two young princes who furnished who furnish us with examples on this subject. One sought temptation and perished in it. The other, without seeking it, encountered it, but left the combat victorious. At the time when kings should go to war, at his own army, as his own army faced the enemy, David, remember King David, strolled about on the roof of the king's house, idling his time away as though he had nothing to do. Being idle in this way, he was overcome by temptation. Bathsheba, in that that inconsiderate lady, went to bathe in a place where she could be seen from the roof of the king's house. Certainly this was an act of unparalleled imprudence, which I cannot excuse, says St. Francis even though several modern writers wish to render it excusable by saying that she did not think of that. Nope, 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 nope. I'm with St. Francis de Sales. Inexcusable. To bathe in a place where she exposed herself to view from the roof of the royal palace was a very great indiscretion. Whether she thought of it or not, young Prince David began by allowing himself to gaze on her and then perished in the temptation which he had sought by his idleness and sloth. You see, idleness is a great help to temptation. Never say, I do not seek it. I am not doing anything. That is enough in order to be tempted. For temptation has a tremendous power over us when it finds us idle. Oh, if David had gone out on campaign at the time he should have gone, or if he had been engaged in something good, the temptation would not have had the power of attacking him, or at least of overcoming and vanquishing him. In contrast, young Prince Joseph, who was later viceroy of Egypt, did not seek temptation at all, and so upon meeting it, he did not perish in it. He had been sold by his brothers, and his master's wife exposed him to danger. But he had never indulged or heeded the amorous glances of his mistress. Rather, he nobly resisted her advances and was victorious. Thus triumphing, not only over the temptation, but also over her who had been the cause of it. If we are led by the Spirit of God to the place of temptation, we should not fear, but should be assured that he will render us victorious. But we must not seek temptation, nor go out to allure it. However holy and generous we may think ourselves to be, for we are not more valiant than David, nor than our divine master himself, who did not choose to seek it. Our enemy is like a a, a chained dog. If we do not approach, it will do us no harm, even though it tries to frighten us by barking at us. But wait a little, I pray you, and see how certain it is that no one who comes to serve God can avoid temptations. We could give many examples Many examples of this, but one or two will suffice. Ananias and Sapphira made a vow to dedicate themselves and their possessions to the perfection which all the first Christians professed, submitting themselves to obedience to the apostles. They had no sooner made their resolution than temptation attacked them. St. Peter said, Who has tempted you to lie to the Holy Spirit? The great apostle St. Paul soon as he had given himself to the divine service, raged himself on the side of Christianity, was immediately, as soon as he had given himself to the divine service and raged himself on the side of Christianity, 
was immediately tempted for the rest of his life. While he was an enemy of God and persecuted the Christians, he did not feel the attack. Let me, let me start that again. While he was an enemy of God and persecuted the Christians, he did not feel the attack of any temptation. That's an awkward. While he was an enemy of God and persecuted the Christians, that's it, he did not feel the attack of any temptation. Or at least he has given us no testimony of it in his writings. But he did when he was converted to our Lord. As long as he was an Orthodox Jew attacking other Jews who believed in the Christ, the Messiah, he wasn't tempted. But as soon as he went to serve that Messiah, he was tempted the rest of his life. Thus, it is a very necessary practice to prepare our soul for temptation. That is, whenever we may be and however perfect we may be, wherever we may be, however perfect we may be, we must rest assured that temptation will attack us. Hence, we ought to be so disposed and to provide ourselves with the weapons necessary to fight valiantly in order to carry off the victory since the crown is only for the combatants and the conquerors. That's a huge message for us today, beloved. There's the music for our first break. We'll be right back. It's a short break, and then we'll take your calls after the second break. Don't go away. The future of the family is grim. As Our Lady of Fatima said, the final battle will be for the family. It truly seems as though we're in the heat of this final battle and we need your help. Our mission at LifeSite News is to educate and activate readers with the information they need to defend life and the family and restore Christian culture. We are currently the most popular pro-life website on the internet with over 40 million unique users every year. And we've been experiencing an even bigger reach than ever this year. But we need your help to reach more of the 7.7 billion people on earth if we are to truly succeed in changing the culture. Please consider donating to help our mission of promoting the culture of life and fearless defenders of the faith like Mother Miriam. Visit give.lifesite.news.com to give today. Thank you for your support. Hi, this is Jim Wright, president of the Station of the Cross. Our 2020 Spring Appeal is officially underway. Please consider a sacrificial donation to help us spread the gospel. The theme of our appeal is changing lives in 2020. In the coming weeks, you may receive a mailing that shows the great gifts you can receive as a Spring Appeal donor. You can also view the gifts by visiting thestationofthecross.com. Your generosity will help us develop our programming, expand our outreach efforts, and continue to grow. To support our mission, please call 1-877-711-8500, 1-877-711-8500, or go to thestationofthecross.com. Use the donation page from your iCatholic Radio mobile app, or use the return envelope from one of our mailings. Your support will change lives in your community and beyond. Thank you, and may God bless you. Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back, beloved, to Mother Miriam Live. I'm happy, happy, happy to be with you. And we are reading through St. Francis de Sales' Sermons for Lent. Um, And we are on a new chapter today uh, titled Temptation, which we all need, all of us, me as well. We all need them. I'm going to just back up a sentence or two uh, to pick up where we left off. And St. Francis de Sales says, It is very necessary 
to practice to prepare our soul for temptation. That is, wherever we may be and however perfect we may be, we must rest assured that temptation will attack us. Hence, we ought to be so disposed and to provide ourselves with the weapons necessary to fight valiantly in order to carry off the victory. Since the crown is only for combatants and conquerors, we ought never to trust in our own strength. Hold on now. In our own strength or in our courage and go out to seek temptation. Never, beloved. Thinking to confound it. There are people who will dare it. I'll, I'll dare. Watch me. Watch me. I can be tempted. I'm, I'm, I'm stronger than that. No. The devil is stronger than you. Um, but if in that place where the Spirit of God has led us, we encounter temptation, we must remain firm in the confidence which we ought to have since that, um, uh, excuse me, which we ought to have that he will strengthen us against the attacks of the enemy, however furious they may be. God will, beloved. He will strengthen you. Let us proceed and continue. Con let us proceed and consider a little the weapons which our Lord made use of to repulse the devil and came, um, the devil that came to tempt him in the desert. And you know, now maybe St. Francis de Sales will say this, but if you look at the devil's three temptations, the lust, uh, the flesh of the eyes, the pride of life, the way the devil tempt tempted Eve in the garden, is the same way he tempted the Israelites, is the same way he tempted our Lord in the wilderness, and it's his same method of tempting us. Nothing new. It's the same thing. In different ways, the same temptations. Um, <clears throat> they were none other, my dear friends, says St. Francis de Sales, than those the psalmist speaks of in the psalm we recite every day at Compline. He who dwells um, in the shelter of the Most High, um, which is St. Francis de Sales, who dwells in the aid of the Most High. That's where we need to dwell. That's our dwelling place. From this psalm, we learn an admiral doctrine. He speaks in this manner as though addressing Christians or someone in particular. Quote, oh, how happy you are, you who are armed with the truth of God, for it will serve you as a shield against the arrows of your enemies and will make you victorious. Therefore, do not fear, O oh, blessed souls, you who are armed with this armor of truth. Fear neither the terrors of the night, for you will not stumble into them, nor the arrows that fly by the day for arrows will not be able to injure you, nor the business that roams in the night, much less the devil that advances and reveals himself at noon. That's a different translation of Psalm 90, beloved. Psalm 91 in the newer translations. Oh, how divinely well-armed with truth, St. Francis says, was our Lord and Master, for he was truth itself. This truth of which the psalmist speaks is nothing other than faith. Whoever is armed with faith need fear nothing. This is the only armor necessary to repel and confound our enemy. For what can harm him who says, Credo, I believe in God? What can harm him who says, I believe in God? I believe in God who is our Father and our Father Almighty. In saying these words, we show that we do not trust in our own strength and that it is only in the strength of God, the Father Almighty, that we undertake the combat, that we hope for victory. No, let us not go on our own to meet temptation by any presumption of spirit, but only rebuff it when God permits it 
to attack us and seek us out where we are, as it did our Lord, as it did our Lord in the desert, by using the words of Holy Scripture. Our dear master overcame all the temptations the enemy presented to him. But St. Francis said that he, he said, I want to be understood that the Savior was not tempted as we are and that temptation could not be in him as it is in us. For he was an impregnable stronghold to which, to which it did not have access just as a man who is vested from head to foot in fine steel could not be injured in any way by the blows of a weapon, since it would glance off on either side, not even scratching the armor, so temptation could indeed encompass our Lord, but never enter into him, nor do any injury to his integrity and, perf- and perfect purity. This is very important, beloved. We see differently. If by the grace of God we do not consent to temptations and avoid the fault and the sin in them, ordinarily we are nevertheless wounded a little by some importunity, trouble, or emotion that they produce in our heart. Not our Lord, beloved. St. Francis says our divine master could not have faith since he possessed in the superior part of his soul from the moment that he began to be a perfect knowledge of the truths faith teaches us. Just as in heaven we won't have faith because our faith, as one song says, will be made sight. We won't have to believe, we'll see. And we won't need hope in heaven because what we've hoped for has arrived. But our Lord wished to make use of his virtue, of this virtue, in order to repel the enemy for no other reason, my dear friends, than to teach all that what we have to do. Do not then seek for other arms or other weapons in order to refuse consent to temptation except to say, I believe. Take that. Take that, Satan. I believe, tough, I believe. And what do you believe? In God, my Father Almighty. St. Bernard, referring to these words of the psalm, which we have cited, said that the terrors of the night of which the psalmist speaks are of three kinds. From this, St. Francis says, I will draw my third lesson. The first fear, the first fear that is that of cowards and slothful souls. Listen to this. Three kinds of temptations. The first fear is that of coward, cowards, and slothful souls. The second, that of children. And the third, that of the weak. Fear is the first temptation which the enemy presents to those who have resolved to serve God. For as soon as they are shown what perfection requires of them, they think, alas, I shall never be able to do it. It seems to them that it is almost an impossibility to attain to that height, and they readily say, O oh God, what perfection is needed to live in this house or in this way of life, and in my vocation, it is too high for me. I cannot attain it. And St. Francis says, do not trouble yourself and do not frame these idle fears that you are not able to accomplish that to which you have found, bound yourself since you are armed and encompassed with the truth of God and with his word. Beloved, if God calls you to something, he'll give you the ability to overcome that and to reach those degrees of perfection by his grace. Having called you to this manner of life and to this house, he will strengthen you and will give you the grace to persevere and to do what is required for his greater glory 
and for your greater welfare and happiness, provided you walk simply in faithful obedience. That's a huge provided. If you don't walk in obedience, you do not have God's protection. Do not be astonished, St. Francis says, therefore, and do not do as the slothful who are troubled when they wake at night by the fear that daylight will come very soon when they will have to work. The slothful and cowardly fear everything and find everything difficult. They find everything difficult and trying because they amuse themselves in thinking with the foolish and slothful imagination which they have created for themselves more about future difficulties than what they have to do at present. Oh, they say, if I devote myself to the service of God, it will be necessary for me to work so much in order to resist the temptations which will attack me. He says, you are quite right, for you will not be exempt from them, since it is a general rule that all the servants of God are tempted. As St. Jerome wrote in that beautiful epistle which he addressed to his dearest daughter, uh, Eustochium, to whom do you wish, I pray, that the devil should present his temptation if not to those who despise them? Sinners tempt themselves. The devil already regards them as his own. They are his confederates because they do not reject his suggestions. On the contrary, they seek them, and temptation resides in them. The devil does not work much to set his snares on the secular world, but rather in retired places where he expects a great gain in bringing about the downfall of souls who are secluded, secluded there serving the divine master more perfectly. There, beloved. If you want to serve God, you're going to be tempted. Two and two is four. But you must know that apart from him, you can do nothing. And if you're slothful and you're disobedient and you give in, your temptations are going to be great and you're going to fail. But if you call on God and you say, even I say often his own words, get thee behind me, Satan and you're faithful and obedient, and you're not slothful, you will have the victory. Love learning more about the church, but confused or disheartened by the struggles we are facing today? Follow LifeSite News Catholic on Facebook, Twitter, or sign up for LifeSite Catholic emails, and stay up to date on the constant stream of news about the Catholic Church. Our church is in a time of crisis, and we as laity have a responsibility and a duty to educate ourselves and stay true to the faith. LifeSite News Catholic is dedicated to keeping the laity informed and educated. To follow us, go to Facebook or Twitter and search LifeSite News Catholic. As Mother Miriam always says, we must live as if it were true. The Catholic Current on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network. Not only women being hurt by abortion, but men being hurt by abortion. If you've got a Y chromosome, you just have to shut up and pay for the abortion. Last time I checked, and I'm no biologist, but it takes two to tango. Tune in weekdays at 5 p.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross and iCatholic Radio for The Catholic Current, bringing Christ to the world and the world to Christ. The Station of the Cross thanks our supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. 
As a non-profit lay organization financially independent from your diocese, our apostolate is listener-supported. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Thank you for your continued support, and may God bless you and your family. Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back, beloved, to Mother Miriam Live. We have a whole half hour together in you're welcome to call in with anything on your heart. It doesn't have to be our subject. It's your subject. It's the matter of your heart. And the toll-free number to call or text is one 511 5483 or email at mother at the station of the cross.com. Uh, we have an email from Sandra who says, Someone recently asked me if it is a requirement for Catholics to celebrate a funeral mass prior to internment. While I'm sure most faithful practicing Catholics would want to have a Mass, I don't know if it was an absolute requirement. <clears throat> I looked this up in your following question, um, just to be sure, Sandra, I, on, on our break, and it is not required to have a Mass prior to internment. It is not qu required to have a funeral Mass. Um, and uh, she writes on a related matter, most Catholics, must Catholics be interred in a Catholic cemetery or can this take place in a non-Catholic cemetery so long as the grave site or mausoleum spot is consecrated beforehand? The, the other thing that I um, found is that there's no requirement for being um, buried in a Catholic cemetery or even that the non-Catholic uh, grave site needs to be consecrated beforehand. Um, uh, uh, most suggest that if you don't have a mass that you would have a memorial service following the funeral. Um, so there's much that can be said there, but I don't know the specific circumstances here, but they, they are not required. Uh, we have a text from someone who writes in anonymously and says, I am reading of the various divisions that seem to be happening in the church, and it is worrisome. Some say that there is a danger of schism. Can you explain exactly what schism is? In your opinion, is there a danger of schism in the church today? A schism is a faction. It's a, it's a separation. When, when people believe strongly two different things, <clears throat> and they part their ways and they they break their union because they have believed different things. So that a schism is a dividing. It breaks any union. And um, is there a danger of schism in the church today? Um, certainly I believe so. Uh, schisms have been part of history and the church, the last huge true schism was the East-West schism in 1054, 1058, I forget exactly the year. Um, hopefully there won't be, there have been minor schisms since then, and hopefully there won't be a schism, but, but there already is. There already is between those who um, um, want to adhere, adhere to a more traditional form of the faith, um, and those who are um, how do I say it, um, kind of going along with just about everything and uh, all the degradation of our society. Okay, let me go to the next email from Michelle. <clears throat> Michelle writes, Hello, Mother. It is with great respect and with the love of Christ that I write to you today. I was troubled as I listened to your radio show March 2nd or 3rd, and sorry that I wasn't able to listen to the entire program. Well, this is a warning ahead. Number one, not sure of the date, but also um, when someone's not able to listen to the entire program or at least the entire message of that subject, whatever it is, um, things can be uh, misunderstood. 
um, but she says, I was not able to listen. I listened to your radio show about whether or not a person should attend a cousin's wedding if that cousin married in a non-Catholic church, and I believe you actually called that person a heretic. Well, um, I wouldn't have called the person a heretic if, if you're... If, if the person's not a Catholic or is a, a cousin's wedding is not a Catholic, um, I don't, I, I, we could call people heretics who depart from the truth of the faith, right? And the Catholic Church is the true church. And anyone who departs from the Catholic Church is a heretic. Anyone who departs from Catholic teaching is a heretic because they teach heresy. Now, in terms of the Reformation, um, we are 500 plus years away from that. And someone who enters Christianity at this point, uh, I would not call a heretic because they haven't left the truth. They entered into what was the fruit of the, the schism. So um, uh, they wouldn't be a personal heretic by choice. Um, she says, Christ is the head of our church and our faith. Yes, he's the head of our church, the Catholic Church, Michelle. He wants all to come to him, yes, and would welcome anyone, yes, just like he did the thief on the cross, absolutely. Only he knows the heart of a person, that's true. There was no Protestant, and I believe it was Lutheran you were referring to, or Catholic viewpoint when Jesus spoke to the thief hanging beside him on the cross. Michelle, that's the point. There was no Protestant. Well, there, there was our Lord's viewpoint, which is the universal. Catholic means universal. It is the church he established. There was no Protestant viewpoint then, because to be Protestant initially um, in the 16th century was to be a Protestant. You protested the Catholic faith which is why you became known as a Protestant. Today, people embrace Christ through Protestantism in its 40,000 denominations, and they're not knowingly protesting the Catholic Church. Protestant has just become a word, but it was the accusation that someone was protesting the church that Christ established. Michelle says, we all have different quirks and even specific theological differences. But this I know as a Catholic who loves Christ, who teaches Bible study and contemplative prayer and welcomes all who want to know God's word. Jesus, our Savior, welcomes anyone who calls on his name. This is true. He came that all should live. This is true. He came for all who would receive him with a, with a born-again heart. Well, we are born again um, by him. Um, by his grace. Um, um, our job is, to, it, it is he who gives us that heart. We don't come to him with that heart. Our job is to lead people to Christ. He died so that I, you, and all who come to the Father through him might have eternal life. I hope that your words would be gentler and inclusive and full of love, that through your platform you would draw people to our faith, faith in Jesus Christ. Let me just mention here, Jesus came to his own Michelle. He came to the Jews. John 1, 11, he came to his own. Those who were his own did not receive him. But he came to his own. And when the Jews came to him in John chapter 8, he said, I am... Um, uh, they, they questioned him. He claimed to know Abraham, and they questioned him. And he said, how could you know Abraham? You're not 30 years old, all of that. And he said to them, before Abraham was, I am. He used God's covenant name, I am. He told them he was God, and therefore he existed before Abraham. And, and they called him, um, let's see, at that point... Um, uh, they called him, I forget the words, but they called him a liar and an imposter and the devil throughout scripture, all kinds of names. And he said to them, um, you are of your God, uh, the devil. You are of your father who is the devil. Um, 
he said, you will, you will die in your sins because you do not believe. Now, I'm, 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 I should have gone to the chapter. I'm saying this by memory. He told his Jewish people that if you do not believe I am he, you will die in your sins. He came to save them. Why wasn't he more welcoming, right? Because they believed what was false. They would not believe what is true. I think the instance with that cousin uh, earlier this month, going, uh, the, the person going to the cousin's um, wedding, um, was that the cousin was a Catholic. And let me just say this. If the cousin was Catholic, then and they were being married outside the church, then no Catholic should have attended that wedding. Because if someone was being married outside the church and then they would consummate that marriage that night and they didn't have a dispensation from the bishop and they were marrying outside the faith, they would be in mortal sin. And to go to a wedding of someone who is putting themselves in the position of mortal sin, that means putting themselves on the road to hell if they don't repent, is not love. That's not welcoming. That is hate. That is helping somebody to hell. We must say to that person, my brother, my sister, my cousin, you're Catholic. I cannot support this wedding. I cannot because you will be turning your back on God and all the sacraments and the graces he's given you. It is not love if I support you in such uh, deep sin. That is not love. You see, Michelle, um, We need tough love as our Lord gave his own people. Um, We need to be truthful with them. And um, let me see what else. Um, She says, I pray you would shine the light of Christ to those seeking him and not get caught up in whether or not it's through our church or through another. Well, Michelle, I don't know to what degree you are truly a Catholic, but God established one church, one church, and... um, he established his truth, which the gates of hell will not come against. And we need to not come against people. We need to help them by understanding that truth and understanding that if they had the grace of God to become Catholic, they need to be very careful um, when they leave it, lest they should be again on the road to hell. Um, and Michelle ends by saying, as long as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are at the center of any church, the theology should not outweigh the love. You see, but they're not. They're at the center of the church our Lord established. Um, I love to love people like Jesus did, she says, and still does today. I am sure you do as well, respectfully and with kindest regards, Michelle. Um, uh, Jesus loved people by telling them the truth, by calling them whitewashed tombs, by saying, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And why, why do you have to say that? So they were more stricter than others. So what? They still had God at their center, you see? That's what they proclaimed. But our Lord knew better, and he, he cursed them. And so we, we must uh, help people and not uh, coddle them along in false churches and false understandings. Um, uh, until it's too late for them to enter heaven. That was a hard thing for me to answer because I didn't know exactly what I said or the circumstance, and Michelle didn't write exactly the circumstance either. Um, but it, it's the same issue. Uh, Protestantism is false. It is, um, again, the fruit of the Reformation. And it uh, the Reformation, Martin Luther and the other Reformers throughout the Pope, throughout what was true, throughout seven books of Scripture, plus other, uh, throughout authority, throughout the sacraments, threw everything out. And you cannot say that what was left is true and that God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is in the center of that. No, God does not cast out God. Absolutely not. Very, very serious. All right, there's our break. We have Margaret on the line. Um, We'll be right back to you, Margaret, uh, right after the break. And you're able to call in anyone who wishes, toll-free at 1-877-511-5211. 
5483 and we'll be right back. LifeSite News is an international news agency devoted to defending life and family and restoring Christian culture. We aim to educate and activate our readers with the information they need to fight the most crucial battles of our day in their churches, workplaces, and families. Our motto is Caritas in Veritate, love in truth. We firmly believe that promoting the truth is an act of love, however hard it is to hear. Over the last 20 years, we have built a reputation for uncompromising reporting, no matter the cost. LifeSite News is by far the most popular pro-life website on the internet, with over 40 million unique users every year and growing. Check us out at LifeSiteNews.com. Hi, this is Jim Wright, President of the Station of the Cross. Our 2020 Spring Appeal is officially underway. Please consider a sacrificial donation to help us spread the gospel. The theme of our appeal is Changing Lives in 2020. In the coming weeks, you may receive a mailing that shows the great gifts you can receive as a Spring Appeal donor. You can also view the gifts by visiting thestationofthecross.com. Your generosity will help us develop our programming, expand our outreach efforts, and continue to grow. To support our mission, please call 1-877-711-8500, 1-877-711-8500, or go to thestationofthecross.com. Use the donation page from your iCatholic Radio mobile app, or use the return envelope from one of our mailings. Your support will change lives in your community and beyond. Thank you, Emmy. God bless you. Welcome to Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network with live video streaming brought to you by LifeSite News and the Station of the Cross. Call Mother with your questions at 1-877-511-5483 or email her at mother at thestationofthecross.com. Welcome back, beloved, to Heart to Heart with Mother Miriam. Um, now, you see, it's a long time that I've said Heart to Heart. It used to be Heart to Heart. It's Mother Miriam Live. Forgive me. Um, the same person, same program, same heart. Um, we have uh, oh, about 10 minutes if you wish to call in or text. Uh, the toll-free number, one 511 5483 or email at mother at the station of the cross dot com. Margaret from Hilton, New York. Are you there, dear one? Yes, I am. Uh, thanks for holding on. Go ahead, honey. Do um, you have a question? I'm trying mm -hmm. to tell a pre trying to tell you this in a quick and a night nutshell because it's gonna to lead to like a temptation. Um when I dated my husband, um it was uh, he became he took instructions, um he was of the Baptist church, not a, a not a church goer, but he was had Bible classes when he was a child. Mm -hmm. So he was he had a kind of consecration. So then, um, when we dated, he took instructions from our pastor at that time, my pastor at that time, and um, he was so he, he seemed to be such an easy convert, and uh, and it was through the Baltimore Catechism, and then. Um, if we went into our, I think our sixth year of marriage, seventh year of marriage. Um, he said he couldn't live it anymore. He said, "I just can't follow the follow it," and it was all due due to follow dealing. the Catholic Church. Yeah, he mm -hmm. came out of it and back and everything because he wasn't really, um, he couldn't live it. His style, he just couldn't live it. And then, mm -hmm. um, plus, he also saw so much hypocrisy. And so I knew he wasn't anchored in Jesus. Um, That's so right. it was really through the head knowledge. And um, so um, so anyway, he did leave the church. We did have five children. So I raised, he did give me uh, money for uh, to send him to parochial school, he says, because I don't know how to teach him. 
and um, help raise them in the, your faith. So um, anyway, just make a long story short, um, this went on. <clears throat> and out of the children, one became a most beautiful uh, reborn Catholic, and, and their, her and her husband are, are had ones on a charismatic renewal thing, international kind of like too. And um, and the other ones left. I, I lost one through a, a death through a car accident, through not to his own fault. But the Lord spoke to my heart through that situation, and I know He's with the Lord. And the other three married Protestant girls, and um, they um, they seem to all worship Jesus in their own personal way. Um, they they believe in Jesus and this and that, but then. Um, my husband, during when those early years of marriage, because of the birth control situation, he couldn't. He had to get into some kind of hobby. Well, this hobby led into um, a becoming a, a driver in car racing, and he was good at it, and he was a track champion. And he spent a lot of time with the car, and I saw it hurting the family. So I cried out one day. I got uh, just cried out to the Lord that I give up because I can't solve this problem. And he spoke to my heart, and it was awesome. And um, I was to fetch a certain book, and um, I didn't know what book to fetch, but I was led to a book, and um, it all in an instant seemed to happen so fast. It's called To Live Again, and it was to turn everything over to the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, my sister told me about the apparitions of Gary Bandel, and, uh, and I got the book and read it, and the Blessed Mother promised that if you would say a rosary every day for bishops and priests who are taking many souls on the road to perdition, that she would contain, um, she would obtain from her son Jesus um, a blessing that you could hardly contain, or you'd be so full of joy. Well, I did that for solid six months and when I was rocking my little baby with some problems with his health, and that's when I got the words, oh, uh, I give up, show me the way, and it's nice to lead to this book. And then let to Gary Bandel and all that. And so then I had the baptism of the Holy Spirit in my home. I didn't know what happened to me. And then I went to a prayer meeting, and then I understood, started to understand. And then I picked up a, a Bible in the church. Someone donated some New Testament Bibles to live um, good news for modern man. And the, the whole Bible became like a love letter from Jesus. It wasn't a history book. And I knew the love of the Holy Spirit was overflowing in me. Well, in the meantime, I would go to the racetrack, but, uh, you know, to, to support my husband. But after seven years of this, the whole racing team broke up and it was all over. But in the meantime, we bought a huge farm, raised five kids, did everything on the farm, then retired. Now he's back into cars, but now he's doing these old antique cars, rebuilding them and just having joy rides on the road with the car clubs. Now, I feel... My, it's drawing me. Is it okay to still sit with my husband in one of these old cars and go along with them? E even though I'd rather be doing something else, doing something to um, serve the Lord in another way. Oh, of course is it's okay. Of course it's okay. It, of course it's okay. Margaret, your wife, number one, your number one vocation is to get your husband to heaven. That's your number one vocation is to get him to heaven. That's how you're serving God, by loving your husband, by bringing Christ to him. You need to be the most holy, uh, loving, the best wife you can be. And let him see how somebody who does live the faith um, can be happy and at peace and can help him. Okay, so then uh, even though... Um, <clears throat> I'm just to, I'm, I'm not being uh, um, double-minded. I mean, I don't want to be double-minded. I just want to follow Christ all the way, 100%. And, um, Is your husband still wanna... living with you? You're still living in your marriage? Oh, oh absolutely. absolutely. No, you, your life is, you're serving God first through your husband, not by ignoring him and going your own way. First by your husband. And be as holy as you can be, watch your conversation, dress modestly, be a beautiful example of God and love to him. And, and, uh, 
and make sacrifices that will draw him uh, back to God. Okay. All right. So then it's not, even though he, he, he's, a, he's, his, he's serving the world in a different way, Even I know he believes in Jesus. There's no question about it. But he just does it in his own personal way. Well, he needs to return to the church and the sacraments. And to believe in Jesus in his own personal way is not very good because we remake God in our own image. He needs to believe in Jesus the way Jesus has come to us as God Almighty, and he is the judge of the living and the dead. So he needs to understand that to believe in Jesus apart from his church is to believe in a a truncated Jesus, because the whole Jesus is his church. The Catholic Church doesn't give us, and the sacraments, they don't give us more than Jesus or other than Jesus, but the whole Jesus. And to believe in the head without the body is is not to understand who the head is. Okay, that's, that's where he's at. He no, that's understand. right. I understand that. So you need to build your relationship with your husband now that your children are out build your relationship with your husband and slowly begin to say to him sweetheart it's not enough to just believe in jesus because you're believing in a jesus that doesn't exist because the jesus who does exist laid down his life for his church the bride of christ the catholic church and i don't i would hate to see you die separated from her and he waits for you to come back in confession. Okay. It's, All right. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a perfect answer. Thank you so much. All right, that. Margaret. God bless you, dear one. There's our ending music, beloved. Um, live the faith with all your heart, all your heart, and we'll speak to you tomorrow. <laughs>